It's a rainy afternoon over Jakarta and inside this aircraft the pilots have just finished their after takeoff procedure and are now turning to avoid some bad weather ahead of them. At the same time a small technical fault has started affecting the aircraft out of throttle. The pilots haven't noticed it yet but when they do their handling of it will start a horrific chain reaction. Stay tuned. In order to fully understand what happened to Srivijaya Flight 182, we need to start the story several years before the accident flight. The aircraft involved was an almost 27-year-old Boeing 737-500, which had been operating for Srivijaya Air since May of 2012. Almost from the very beginning, there had been some technical issues with this aircraft, and particularly with the auto throttle system. As the name suggests, the outer throttle system controls the two engine thrust levers of the aircraft and it works together with the autopilot to control the aircraft's thrust output and through that its speed, climb and descent rates. The outer throttle is normally always connected when the autopilot is connected, but it can also work without the autopilot during, for example, takeoff and manually flown go-arounds. It is a very good system, which takes away a lot of workload from the pilots and because it's physically moving the thrust levers, it's also considered to be very transparent and reasonably easy to monitor. When the outer throttle is engaged, it can be disconnected in a few ways, including pressing either the disconnect switches on the thrust levers or by switching off the arm switch on the mode control panel. But it will also disconnect if the system itself feels certain faults, for example an excessive difference between the thrusts commanded by the left and the right thrust lever. The reason for this is to make sure that the outer throttle doesn't create a situation where the aircraft experiences asymmetrical thrust, which could affect its controllability. The system that monitors this particular feature is called the Cruise Thrust Split Monitoring System. It is designed to switch off the outer throttle when the autopilot roll control feels that it needs significant use of spoilers in order to maintain the requested track, together with the difference felt in the thrust output. The spoilers are those little flaps on top of the wings that work together with the ailerons to control the aircraft's roll. In order for the cruise thrust split monitoring system to be activated, certain criteria needs to be met. Those criteria include the flaps being extended to less than 12.5 degrees, the aircraft not being in a takeoff or a go around, and the spoiler deflection recorded as more than 2.5 degrees for 1.5 seconds. I know this is incredibly technical, but it will become important very soon, trust me. Like I mentioned before, this aircraft had a history of problems with the outer throttle. Since 2013, there had been 65 different pilot reports of it either disconnecting or not being able to connect or simply not working properly. The problem seemed to be mainly connected to the number two thrust lever, which was controlling the right hand engine. After each report, the engineering team had been troubleshooting the issue. In the majority of the cases, cleaning the electrical connectors of the outer throttle components would sort the problem out. And after each time that the maintenance had dealt with the problem, a so-called BITE or built-in test equipment test had been performed from the FMC CDU to verify that the system worked properly and in most cases it would indicate no faults. But that only lasted for a little while before the problems would come back again. These issues continued to appear now and then for eight years prior to the accident flight and during those years several components of the outer throttle systems were changed to try and sort it out, but the fault just kept reappearing. Now normally a reoccurring fault like this would be highlighted by the company's maintenance organization, but due to some restructuring inside the company during this period this unfortunately did not happen. So what was actually going on here? Why wasn't the issues fixed when component, including the number two engine, was replaced? Well, the most likely a culprit was some kind of temporary resistance or binding within the mechanical parts of the outer throttle system, which just caused the right thrust lever to move less easy at times. Maybe there was resistance in a pulley or some component could rub up against some other component in certain situations. We will never really know that. There were specific maintenance checks available to check for those kind of problems, specifically if asymmetric thrusts had been observed, but since none of the pilots had reported any splits between the thrust levers, these tests were never performed. Instead, the aircraft was released to service after the connectors had been cleaned and the fault no longer manifested itself. So, had there actually been any split thrust lever events during these years? As it turns out, there definitely had been. 
The aircraft was equipped with a device called a Quick Access Recorder or QAR. This is a device similar to a flight data recorder which collects loads of technical data from the aircraft on every given flight. But unlike the flight data recorder which is encapsulated in the back ceiling of the aircraft, the QAR is really easy for the aircraft engineer to access and download data from. It is used to keep track of maintenance issues and highlight any potential technical problems that maybe the pilots haven't even noticed. The QAR data from the accident aircraft had been downloaded continuously, but due to a problem with the program used to evaluate the data, the failure codes from this particular aircraft had not been highlighted. So can you already start to see the holes of the Swiss cheese starting to line up? When the data from this aircraft's QAR was eventually evaluated, it showed that on seven different occasions during the year before the accident, the right thrust lever had gotten stuck as the outer throttle was trying to move it. It had mainly happened as the aircraft started to descend and the thrust levers were supposed to move into the idle position. Both of the thrust levers would start to move, but then the right would stop at some point and the left would continue to reduce, leading to asymmetric thrust. On some of the recorded flights, the crew would have noticed it and repositioned the thrust lever manually, and then on some, it would only happen for a few seconds and then disappear before the pilots even noticed it. The failure generally didn't cause any major problems, except in one case, which will become very significant to this story. On the 15th of March 2020, a little less than one year before the accident flight, a crew was climbing out of the takeoff and was cleared to level off at 5,000 feet. As the aircraft climbed past 4,400 feet, the autopilot started to pitch down to prepare to capture the altitude. And as that happened, the autotrottle started pulling the thrust levers back to keep the speed. Initially, both thrust levers moved, but the right thrust lever stopped at a 34 degree angle, while the left kept continuing going backwards. This immediately started to create significant asymmetric thrust, and as the right engine was trying to yaw the aircraft to the left, the autopilot started to compensate with aileron and spoilers to the right in order to try and keep the aircraft flying straight ahead. After about 7 seconds, the autopilot was unable to keep the track as requested and just simply disconnected. The control wheel or yoke was deflected 19 degrees to the right when the autopilot gave up and immediately, because of the asymmetric thrust, the aircraft rolled over to the left with a bank angle of close to 40 degrees. The first officer, who was pilot flying, immediately turned the control wheel more to the right in order to try and counteract the roll. He also immediately disconnected the outer throttle and corrected the thrust levers to get rid of the asymmetric thrust. This eventually rectified the situation, but during the maneuver, the aircraft rolled from 44 degrees to the left to 28 degrees to the right, and they also overshot their cleared altitude with 1,300 feet before it was fully under control. This was a significant incident, and definitely something that the pilots were required to report, both to engineering through a tech log entry, but also to the company and the authorities. Unfortunately, this was never done, nor was any of the other six occurrences of asymmetric trust that was found indicated on the quick access recorder. This reluctance to report these types of incidents could point to an issue with the safety culture inside of the airline, because accurate reporting is what forms the backbone to any good safety management system. But the most shocking part of this story was not the lack of reporting. No, it was that the captain who was experiencing this first upset sequence was the very same man who would later become the captain on the accident flight, less than a year later. And that brings us to the 9th of January 2021, but before I explain the accident sequence, here comes a short message from my sponsor. If you will be doing banking on your phone or laptop while you're traveling, I highly recommend you to use today's sponsor NordVPN. Because believe me when I tell you that having your bank account frozen while you're traveling overseas really sucks. And it can happen if the bank senses a login from an unexpected country. By using NordVPN, it looks like I'm always at home in Spain. And also, if you didn't know it already, doing payments while you're using unsecured Wi-Fi can put your banking information at risk. So avoid that. NordVPN protects you against hackers lurking on the networks as well as phishing websites and they ensure anonymity in payments by credit cards and PayPal. But still, make sure that you never ever click on any email link that you don't trust. 
With NordVPN, you'll get access to more than 5,400 servers in 60 different countries. So you can still watch your favorite content from anywhere in the world while you're traveling or access other countries' streaming content from home. NordVPN bypasses censorship and country restrictions to give you total online freedom. So if you go to nordvpn.com slash pilot right now, you'll get an exclusive two year deal plus one month completely free. So you don't have anything to lose. Thank you NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now let's continue. Srivijaya flight 182 was a normal passenger flight scheduled to fly from Jakarta airport to Supadio International Airport in Pontianak. The weather on the 9th of January was not great, with thunderstorms in the area and at times quite moderate rain. The flight was scheduled to depart slightly after midday at 13.40 local time. It was going to be the first flight of the day for the operating crew, but the aircraft had already flown four earlier flights without any technical issues reported. The captain in charge of the flight was 54 years old and very experienced, with over 17,900 hours of total time and 9,000 of those hours being on the type. His training record showed okay general performance, but that he had had struggles during a recent simulator session with some minor points raised by the instructor, but then they were practiced to achieve a satisfactory standard. The last time that he had practiced aircraft upset and recovery procedures was about two years earlier and with satisfactory results. But that fact actually caught my eye a bit, because after the Air France 447 disaster, upset prevention and recovery training had been made mandatory all over the world and it was supposed to be implemented in every single simulator training event. These pilots would have done at least one, but probably two simulated checks per year, so to me it didn't really make sense that the last time that he had practiced this was two years earlier. But this was explained by the fact that even though the Indonesian aviation authorities had included the UPRT requirement in 2017, they hadn't provided any guidance to the airlines on how this training was supposed to be performed. This lack of information had led to Srivijaya Air not implementing this training sufficiently to its pilots, so yet another safety barrier crossed. The captain was joined in the cockpit by a 20 years younger first officer. He had been flying for the company since 2013 and was also quite experienced with over 5100 hours of total time and almost all of them being flown on the Boeing 737. He also had an okay training history, but had also required some debrief after his last simulator session, mainly on execution of non-normal maneuvers and identification of malfunctions. His last upset recovery training was also done nearly two years earlier, in July 2019. Once the pilots had finished reviewing their planning documentations, they briefed their four cabin crew members and then walked out to the aircraft to start their pre-flight procedures. The first officer was going to be pilot monitoring, so he did the walk around whilst the captain went straight to the cockpit to verify the technical status and start setting up the aircraft. When he looked through the tech log, the aircraft looked perfectly fine, but if he would have looked a bit further back through the tech log, he would have seen that during the previous week, the outer throttle system had been reported as unserviceable on two different occasions. The engineering team had cleaned several connectors and managed to clear the reported fault, meaning that there was no open tech log issues with the outer throttle at the time of this flight. The standard instrument departure that they were planning to fly was the Abasa 2 Delta departure from runway 25 right. That route required the aircraft to climb straight ahead to 1000 feet and then turn right towards the Arnav points Vinar, Anjuna and then Nabil to then continue following the departure. This first flight of the day didn't have many passengers booked, only 56 of them, so the boarding probably went relatively quickly. But due to the poor weather around the airport, the aircraft was still delayed around 50 minutes before it started pushing back, which they did around 14.21 local time. After the pushback and engine start was complete, the first officer requested taxi clearance and the aircraft started taxiing out towards the holding point for runway 25 right. At almost the same time, another flight going to the same destination started taxiing slightly behind them and was directed to continue to their holding point for runway 25 left for their departure. During the taxi out, everything went smoothly. The pilots performed the before takeoff checklist, which included arming the outer throttle for takeoff. 
it armed normally and at time 1436 when the captain pushed the toga button the outer throttle moved both thrust levers forward and set the thrust correctly and the aircraft started rolling down the runway. The takeoff was completely normal and after the gear was retracted and the aircraft was above 400 feet the captain asked the first officer to engage LNAV. LNAV is a lateral navigation mode which sends signals to the flight directors and later also the autopilot on how to follow the departure routing and the later routes towards the destination. After he had done that, the first officer contacted the Terminal East air traffic controller who responded that the aircraft was identified on radar, that they could continue to fly the departure route and continue to climb to flight level 290. The first officer read back the clearance and the flaps were then retracted and when the aircraft climbed through 1780 feet, the captain engaged the autopilot. From this point, the outer throttle was giving the selected climb thrust and since they were climbing in a vertical mode called level change, the aircraft was pitching to maintain the speed of 220 knots, which was selected on the mode control panel. Now, it is common to keep the speed around 220 knots for the first turn of a departure, to keep the turn radius accurate. If the aircraft accelerates more than that, it can start flying wider than the route, which is not good. The reason that that is so important to understand is because with only 56 passengers on board, the aircraft would have been very light. Using level change with such a low speed would have given the aircraft a very high climb rate. Now, during normal circumstances, when you have a very high climb clearance like these pilots did, that's not really a problem. But if they would be told to level off early, they would need to slow this climb rate down in order to avoid potentially triggering any TCAS warnings for traffic above. Like I mentioned earlier, there were also some rain showers and storm clouds around the area, and at time 1438, about two minutes into the flight, it seems like the pilot spotted something on their weather radar. Because the autopilot mode now changed from LNAV to head and select, meaning that the aircraft now no longer would follow the cleared route and instead it would start to turn towards heading 070 degrees, which is what the captain had selected on the mode control panel. Now, we don't know if the captain mentioned this to the first officer because the cockpit voice recorder did not pick up the captain's voice channel throughout this entire flight. But in any case, it seems like the captain now also recognized the high climb rate, possibly because he realized that this new heading could potentially take him closer to other traffic in the area. So he changed the pitch mode from level change to vertical speed and selected the lower climb rate. Now, if you do that and you don't increase the selected speed, the aircraft will start pitching down and as it does, the system will realize that it needs less thrust to keep the commanded speed of 220 knots with this lower climb rate. And this is exactly what happened. The outer throttle now started to try and pull the thrust levers back and here is where this accident scenario really starts. Because at time 1438 and 40 seconds, the thrust levers started reducing from the selected climb thrust setting of about 92.3% N1, but the right thrust lever only moved a very small bit, stopping at a setting of 91.8%. This meant that from this point, the two thrust levers started to split from each other, and with that came an increasing difference in engine thrust between the left and the right side. The aircraft was climbing through 7950 feet when this happened, still in a right hand turn towards the heading of 070 degrees, which the captain had selected. None of the pilots noticed this split happening, likely because they were looking outside, possibly for the weather or for some other reason. The first officer asked the captain if he wanted to turn to heading of 075 degrees, maybe to get a bigger distance margin to the bad weather ahead. The captain must have agreed to this because the first officer then called air traffic control and asked if they could turn to heading of 075 degrees to avoid, and the controller agreed to that. 30 seconds later, the controller told the flight to level off at 11,000 feet because on that heading that they were now turning to, they would otherwise come into conflict with that other flight that I mentioned earlier, which had taken off from with 25 left just after them. The first officer read back this new clearance and the captain set 11,000 feet on the mode control panel as the aircraft climbed through 8,800 feet. Important to understand here is that the outer throttle was now trying to reduce the thrust to keep both the speed and the requested vertical speed as accurately as possible. 
In this case, since the right thrust lever wasn't moving and therefore still produced climb thrust, it meant that the left thrust lever needed to reduce even further to achieve that same result. This led to a bigger and bigger split between the two thrust levers. Now, you might ask yourselves, wasn't there supposed to be a system that monitors the outer throttle to keep precisely this from happening? And yes, there was, the cruise thrust split monitoring system, but for some reason this system did not activate when it was supposed to. The investigators later tried to figure out the reason for that and the most likely explanation was that the sensors who was monitoring how much the flight spoilers were extending on the wings didn't send accurate data back to the system, possibly because they hadn't been rigged correctly. The spoiler rigging had never been properly verified during the aircraft's time with Srivijaya Air because there hadn't been any indicated need for it. So what was the real effect of all of this then? Well, the aircraft was in the middle of a right-hand turn when the split started to happen. And the split caused the engine on the right side to produce a lot more thrust than the one on the left side. That difference in thrust would act opposite to the turn direction and try to veer the aircraft to the left instead. This in turn meant that the autopilot would need to input more and more aileron to the right to continue the turn. Now, the autopilot has a limit to how much aileron it can command, which sits at around 19 degrees of control wheel input, meaning that after this max input is reached, the autopilot cannot do any more. And this will become critical very soon. When the aircraft climbed through 10,100 feet, an altitude warning went off in the cockpit, alerting the pilots that they were about to reach their cleared altitude. This prompted the first officer to call out, approaching 11,000 feet, and at this point, passing 10,000 feet, he also needed to complete several checklist items, including turning off the landing lights, verify the aircraft's pressurization, and potentially also turn off the fasten seatbelt sign for the passengers. This meant that he was likely not looking down at his instrument at this point, and the captain evidently wasn't either. Because around this time, the autopilot reached its maximum right control wheel input. The left engine thrust had now reduced to 67.5% and was still reducing, with the right engine still producing around 92%. The aircraft had up until this point been turning right with a 15 degree bank turn, but now slowly rolled over to the left instead and started a left hand turn, opposite to what the autopilot was trying to do. At time 14.39 and 54 seconds, the aircraft climbed through 10,500 feet with an increasing left bank passing 7 degrees. The thrust on the left engine was now back to 49%, with the right engine still at climb thrust. The first officer called out, set standard, indicating that the aircraft was about to climb through the transition altitude, and that call was immediately followed by a call from air traffic control, clearing them to continue the climb to flight level 130. This instruction was read back by the first officer and the captain was heard in the background verifying 130, which would indicate that he had set that on the mode control panel. This means that he was likely looking at the mode control panel at this point, because if he would have been looking at his EADI, he would have seen something very worrying. Due to the increasing asymmetric thrust, the aircraft was now starting to roll quicker and quicker to the left, but the control wheel was still 19 degrees to the right as the autopilot was still trying to rectify the issue. The next thing that happened was a sudden GPWS bank angle warning as the left bank exceeded 37 degrees. The captain responded uh, to this indicating clear surprise and the first officer said uh, sorry? And what do you think happened next? Well. To explain this in a way that makes sense, let's try and put you in the captain's situation here. He has, for whatever reason, not been looking down at his instruments for the last 20 seconds or so. The aircraft is inside cloud at this point, meaning that he likely has no outside horizon to guide him. His mental model would have been that the aircraft was in a right bank, turning towards the heading that he had selected. He now suddenly hears a bank angle warning, and when he looks down, the first thing that he likely sees is the control wheel displays far to the right, confirming his mental model. So, what would you do if you hear a bank angle warning and see the control wheel to the right? Yes. The initial reaction the captain did was to disconnect the autopilot using the trim switch on his yoke and then move the control wheel to the left for the next four seconds. <laughs> 
Since the aircraft was actually already in a hard left roll at this point, this caused the bank to quickly increase to over 110 degrees, a severe upset situation. The left thrust was now at 34% and the right was still at 92%, making the recovery even harder and undoubtedly very confusing. The maximum altitude that the aircraft reached was 10,700 feet, after which it rapidly started descending as the notes pitched down because of the upset. Now, this is an almost perfect example of how strong confirmation bias can be and the reason why monitoring the aircraft instruments and systems is so important. Another thing that is important to understand here is how humans react to a startle and surprise, which likely came together in this event. Startle is caused by a sudden intense stimuli, like the bank angle warning and the sudden roll. This generally causes a reflex response, like for example disconnecting the autopilot before realizing what is actually going on. Now, that could also explain why the captain used the trim switch to disconnect the autopilot, which is a very odd way of doing that. And when a startle is combined with genuine surprise, in this case over the direction of the bank and why it was happening in the first place, it can take bank much angle. longer for the brain to readapt bank to the situation and bank regain angle. situational awareness. Surprise will cause the brain's attention system to focus harder, but it also reduces the working memory. This can make it really easy to focus on only one thing, like the yoke position, at the expense of other, more Bank important angle. information, like the instrumentation. And since the working memory is impaired, it can become really hard to remember learned procedures and responses. Again, this is why maintaining accurate situational awareness at all times is the best guard against situations like this. Five seconds after the opposite situation had started, the auto throttle disconnected, but not by any of the pilots. Instead, it was likely the previously mentioned monitoring system that finally kicked in, but at that point it was sadly already too late. The first officer could be heard calling out, Captain, Captain, followed by upset, upset, as the aircraft started diving down towards the sea at an almost 90 degree angle. The overspeed warning clacker now went off as the speed increased towards 400 knots, and the first officer called out the final, Captain, Captain before, only 27 seconds after the upset had begun, the aircraft crashed into the Java Sea and all 62 passengers and crew instantly perished. Air traffic control tried to get into contact with the aircraft several times and also asked other aircraft in the area to check if they could see anything, but with no result. This search operation started immediately and quite soon aircraft parts and aviation fuel was found floating on the sea surface at a location close to the aircraft last radar position about 20 kilometers away from Jakarta airport. The wreckage was later found on the sea floor at a depth of around 18 meters and three days after the crash the flight data recorder was found together with the housing of the cockpit voice recorder but the actual CVR recording unit was not inside. It took nearly three months to find the remaining pieces of the cockpit voice recorder and it was only after that that the investigators could really put the final pieces of the puzzle together and understand what had happened on this flight. Very early on the investigators honed in on the maintenance records of the outer throttle. Those records together with the data from the flight data recorder showed a pretty clear picture. This accident was caused by, as always, a combination of factors. First, there was the maintenance procedures, which had failed to rectify the almost decade-long issues with the outer throttle. This then led to the right thrust level malfunctioning on this flight, causing a thrust asymmetry. This failure was then compounded by a secondary hidden fault that stopped the cruise thrust split monitoring system from disconnecting the outer throttle, making the situation even worse. The pilots were then found to not have properly monitored their instruments, including the engine instrumentation and the thrust level position. And finally, they didn't execute the correct aircraft upset recovery techniques after the upset had happened. The reason they couldn't handle the upset was likely because of lacking upset prevention and recovery training provided by the airline, which in turn was due to lacking guidance from the regulator. <laughs> 
Sribiaya Air was also found to have implemented their own variation on how to fly an upset recovery procedure, which had not been approved by Boeing, and it included several calls and steps that could act as distractions during the upset recovery. This accident led to several recommendations to both the airline and the regulator in order to improve the weaknesses I just mentioned. They also included several improvements on general maintenance procedures. This was a very sad and unnecessary accident that could likely have been avoided if the lessons from other accidents like Colgan Air or Air France 447 had been properly implemented. It also shows again what an important role the pilots play as the last line of defense after all other safety barriers fall. If we are not paying attention, we can't fulfill that role. But another thing that I found really interesting in this one is that I've showed several examples of accidents where the role of the passive, non-moving side stick of Airbus aircraft have been discussed. But in this case, it was likely actually the active position of the steering wheel that caused that initial pilot misunderstanding. And that just goes to show that it matters very little how the systems are designed if we, the pilots, don't take the time to properly understand them and act appropriately. Now, check out this video next or binge on this playlist. Consider checking out my sponsor to help support the channel or buy some merch or join my Patreon crew. I'm really looking forward to see you there. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.